Kamil Khan Mumtaz is a world renowned architect of Pakistan. He went to the Architectural Association School of Architecture in 1957. After having worked in London for 2 years and also teaching at the Kumasi in Dhana for another 2 years, he returned to Pakistan in 1966 and joined as a professor and head of department of architecture at the National College of Arts Lahore. Up to 1979 His work has been guided by the rationalist and functionalist philosophy of the modern movement but within this framework he had been seeking to evolve an architecture that would be relevant and responsive to the regional realities of climate economy available technologies and materials he continues to search for materials structural forms and techniques that are relevant and appropriate to the physical and economic realities of the time and place in which he works coming to architecture was because i was interested in art and in science so i was advised that there's one field that can combine these two interests and that's architecture so that's how i decided um to to take up architecture and followed my senior habib Fedali to the AA in London the Architectural Association School of Architecture but at that until that point i had really no not much idea about what architecture entails or indeed the significance of the architectural association as a, a very unusual school and this was uh, in the mid 20th century and the architectural association was right at the forefront the cutting edge uh in in modern thought on architecture and so i was able to assimilate uh the um, meanings and the philosophy of architecture uh, of modernism the meaning of architecture um it's an art and science of building so we have to uh, consider both these aspects uh, as an art it deals with beauty uh, with perfection with skill and as a science science is about knowledge and the, what we do is design and build buildings and buildings are of course physical objects but they are more than just physical objects they are also form and the form can be significant a symbol a metaphor a sign and like a word it becomes a language through which you can communicate uh, concepts ideas information what is the function what is the role of um, architecture or for that matter art in society i believe that it is the function not only of art but also science to to reveal to unveil the reality uh, that lies beneath appearances why that is important is because we need to know who am i where am i the world the cosmos where am i coming from history and it's only in the light of the answers to those questions that we determine where do i want to be where do i want to go what what so any action must be preceded by whether it's a conscious or subconscious answer to these big questions identity reality history and then we establish our goals and objectives in life and whatever we do what i learned in my training as an architect as i said 
the most important aspect of that was uh, to assimilate and indeed to embrace modernism. And this, in the context of the times, the mid-20th century, um, I was coming from a newly independent nation and the post-colonial times, uh, the heyday of modernism. What modern, the modernist answer to the big questions was that what reality is, is the physical material reality. What man is, what am I, is an intelligent, um, rational animal. But the most important question or concept is the modernist idea of change. Now modernism saw change as a continuous necessary pro process of progress, development, growth, evolution. And saw man as an active agent who can determine his own destiny by gaining knowledge of the principles uh, of the physical cosmos. So this idea of progress, development, in short, this is modernism's promise of the material paradise. And this is an extremely uh, powerful idea. And for the whole world, it's not surprising that this very quickly became the dominant uh, idea driving the developed world and the industrial world, of course, but also as an inspiring idea for the so-called underdeveloped developing uh, cultures who, who wanted to catch up. So um, I returned to Pakistan, fired up with the ideals of modernism and uh, this notion of being able to contribute to my people, my nation, to help them to come out of poverty, backwardness, underdevelopment and march forward to, to a more developed um, state of well-being uh, and, and prosperity for everyone. So this is uh, essentially what I was trying to say through my work in the 60s and 70s. But um, then I began to, I became increasingly aware that there is something that I'm missing. Certain events around 1979 or 1980 led me to the realization that I knew nothing about the architectural heritage, history and traditions of my own culture. Then, as I began to re-educate myself, I discovered not only an entirely different basis for and a approach to architecture, but a radically different world view, which has changed my life. For me, as a consistent with the modernist um, credo, style was irrelevant. The important thing was function, rationality, and in other words, the, the message the philosophy. So architecture and all of art, apart from the material and form, is a language. And clearly what I was missing was the, the language which was intelligible to my audience. And like any language, is rooted in a worldview. All the nuances, the subtleties, the meanings, the inflections of are, 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 are the, the words are really reflecting 
uh, the deepest concepts in a culture. So not only did I, did I uh, realize that what, what I need to understand is this traditional world view, but immediately it became clear that this concept of reality is the truth. And what I had believed unquestioning, unquestioningly as the modernist, materialist, physicalism was immediately apparent that this was a fallacy. There was something very wrong with this. And so this is how I um, uh, decided oh, that was the turning point. Um, so it, it, uh, as I learned more and more, I became more convinced in the ideological foundations of tradition that tradition was not a matter of uh, pointed arches or lime or, or, or history, the past. It is a, an attitude, a position regarding man and his relationship to the world and the purpose of being in this world. So, with this, um, I've, my work also began to change. Uh, it was a long process and I can assure you that the most difficult part of this is to unlearn what one has learned already. Uh, so, but, so this has been a struggle of uh, really getting rid of the baggage of modernism and uh, learning the, in the deepest sense uh, the meaning and the worldview of which is tradition. So I would call myself today a traditionalist uh, as opposed to a modernist. What are the challenges for architecture today? Well, I think that the biggest challenge for all of us is multinational global corporate capital. Global corporate capital is now already fully entrenched and is in possession and it's constantly expanding what it possesses, owns, and the, the, the means for the power it derives is from money, capital. And with this, it is dominating our minds, our hearts. It is in control of everything we do. The sports we enjoy, we look at cricket because it's the best platform for advertising. The programs we look at, the, the plays, teleplays, they're decided by the sponsors. They're all multinational corporations. The music we like is determined by the same big global capitalists. Everything, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, and the architecture we build. It is now no longer in our control. It is an unbeatable enterprise. Because with this enormous concentration of wealth, the amount that the corporate sector can put into research and development is impossible for a small operator to equal. The result, what they produce, is of unbeatable quality. Then, given the scale of their operations, production and the market, the global scale of the market, the scale ensures that they can bring the costs down that you can't compete with that. And then, the power of media, which they control, marketing and 
dis, 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 get deciding what we want, what we like. They d decide that. This is an unbeatable enterprise. So, you might say, what's wrong with that? If you're getting the best quality for the lowest price and the great follow-up services, what's the problem? The problem is, it's killing us. Literally. It's this consumerism, this superheated overproduction, this concentration of the wealth into lesser and lesser hands. The result is, we are consuming ourselves to death, depleting our resources and poisoning the earth, the water. The so the whole global ecological crisis is a product of this pursuit of power, wealth, domination, control. And underlying this is that modernist ideology of progress, evolution, development and growth. The problem with that is that it is a one-way, endless st story of this is absurd. No change is a one-way uh, movement to progress, development. It's not possible. It's logically absurd. And this obsession with growth, I can best quote, I forget who said this, but someone said that growth for growth's sake is the ideology of a cancer cell. This is a cancer that is eating us. What it feeds on is the idea of progress, development and growth. And this desire for more and more and more, it's a drug. And now we have become addicted to this drug. And like any addict, we are looking for pushers to expand our sources the, and to provide the means for us to feed this hunger. This addiction is killing us and we are loving it. So, um, we can see the results, the global a crisis, ecological, economic, sociological, and indeed even ideological. The rates of distressed individuals, suicides, um, and this is part of the same phenomenon. The question of progress of Pakistan architecture, etc., naturally comes from the same notion of the inevitability and the necessity of continuous progress, progress, progress. When, where, where does this idea come from? Today we assume that continuous progress, development, evolution is the normative state of man. And to question this is feel very surprising. What do you mean? What else do you expect? We will continuously progress and develop. But I would like you to consider that all of these graphs that we are so familiar with, the exponential curve going up, this is only showing the, 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 the growth and development of 150 years. Now man's existence is much, much more than 150 years. It's more than 150,000 years, a million years, and now people are saying maybe nine, three million years. So, one of the benefits of having 
to relearn um, tradition and what I have learned from the uh, world view is to have a larger perspective of things. And this narrow vision, tunnel vision, where human history appears to be continuously progressing and development, if you just expand this window a little bit, you find this curve just flattens out. And you take it back a million years, it's flat. No remarkable progress, development, and no damage to the environment, in complete harmony and balance with nature. So, the normative state of man is not this exponential curve up. The normative state of man is the state he has been in for three million years. It's only quite recently, about five to nine thousand years ago, the first hiccup in this sustained balance harmony with nature was with the agricultural revolution. This was the first deviation from the norm. But that deviation still remained within the band of normal, norm, normalcy. So, the deviation, you could come back to the norm. With the modern movement, we have transgressed beyond the limits of sustainability. And now, in the post-industrial stage that we are, this consumerist stage, global capitalism, it's really now gone over the edge. It is in free fall. This is not normal. What we are living in are not normal times. This rate of change which is approaching infinity is in any change there is a point where anything comes into existence it's an infinite change from nothing to anything. It then develops and grows evolves not forever but into its normative condition which it sustains not forever for a certain duration and then it either crosses the limits and explodes or fizzles out and goes beyond the sustainable limits. So, this is nothing to celebrate. This is nothing to be happy about. This is the second moment in, our, in human existence where the rate of change is reaching infinity. It is what any doctor will tell you is the terminal stage. So, the drug, druggy is now terminal. It's in free fall. So, where does tradition come in? As I said, why we have come to this point is because of deviating from what, what tradition was, was a, the, the central message of all civilized man the great literature, the dramas, the religions, were all roadmaps on how to get back to the normal stage. Now, we say, what normal? This is the normal stage. <laughs> and we are so happy, we want to accelerate it more and more. So, um, this is where we add. So, but, what do you do? Do you give up? Or do you go with the tide? So, my advice for young people, anyone, what should, should we do? The first, what is needed is to discern. To discern between right and wrong. 
and this needs to be said because in this postmodernist era we have decided that there is no distinction between right and wrong it's all relative and plural and alternate this is all right for you this is all right for me but it is not all right there is a difference between right and wrong the first thing we need to do is to discern between right and wrong and then do what is right not because we expect to bring down this curve not because we expect to change the world do what is right because it's the right thing to do that's all pakistani architecture like architecture at any time and anywhere reflects the beliefs and practices of those times and those cultures so pakistani architecture today reflects the pakistan of today and the pakistan of today wants to be right up in the forefront going faster overtaking everybody else we just want to go to hell before everybody else this is um, a, a, a saying in the petroleum industry when you discover oil you want to dig as fast as you can it's a race they call it the race to the bottom before anybody else gets there you should exhaust that well so this what we are in is a race to the bottom and everyone wants to get there first and pakistan is no different so but we don't have what it takes so we just want those things without the resources to do it so we beg borrow steal lie do anything to have it's really a drug addiction situation our governments behave like that our individuals behave like that our professional architects behave like that so it's that we have become totally whatever the term is where you become like an alcoholic on alcohol or a, you can't live without the drug and it just goes on you want more and more and more so we don't understand even the philosophical basis of postmodernism we just want the feel and looks it should look and feel good so we want the trappings the style the paraphernalia we don't know why it looks like this but this is the latest this is modern this is what we want to be it has become symbols of growth and progress and development and we want to be there first and like everything else as i said sport music drama clothes food architecture is now dominated and controlled by global capital corporate capital i go into buildings now new buildings and i'm always looking around to find one thing which has been designed by an architect is nothing entire buildings are now pre-engineered and brought on site the structure is assembled and everything from the roofing to the flooring to the wall coverings the windows the doors the lights the plumbing everything are products from the global corporate machine the profession now is going through what the medical profession a few decades ago where the, the family doctor who used to come round with the bag has now set up shop and the pharmaceuticals send out their representatives and they say here's the latest medicine for this try this sample use this and I'll give give you a commission for it we have the same thing happening now in my office in every your office everywhere every day we get these representatives with their brochures and their 
promotionals and oh so this is the what we're importing it's all imported this is the latest and what is the architect architecture now is just another platform for marketing these products all the architect has to do this the what is why do they need architects is to make that showroom that display eye catching that's the function of the architect make it as eye catching as possible so that we can pin all our cladding aluminum glass green products stuck on the lighting everything and you can find imaginative ways of using this product so that it becomes even more attractive that's the only function of the architectural profession really the architect has architecture is bankrupt it has no idea or it, it thinks that its business is making forms but what is the basis of making forms there is nothing all you have to do is to think up now you don't even have to think up anything you just get the appropriate algorithm to think for you so as long as they are forms that are eye catching it has served its purpose so it's a complete takeover by the same corporate sector so the main thing to keep in mind as i said that all art and architecture is also a medium of communication a means of communication and like any communication there has to be a language and that the traditional language that has evolved over millennia in any location uh is deeply ingrained in the history the culture the memories the values of that culture so it has meaning and communicates to that culture so these geometries these forms whether they're floral or calligraphic are all speaking transmitting a message the important thing is the message not the style yes. and we just only look at the surface appearance and we either like or dislike the form and the color and we don't bother to read the message which is which is meant to be understood through um so every religion every tradition uh, has its language of art and architecture um in in muslim cultures generally there is a, a use of geometry but also floral motifs and particularly calligraphy other cultures may use images or metaphors or similes or symbols um all of these are forms of communicating information knowledge concepts but these concepts what is being communicated is not physical it's not so what what they are trying to get across through a physical form is a metaphysical idea and the the traditional world view is that the reality the principal prior reality is the metaphysical the metaphysical truth is absolute universal and but it has infinite manifestations so what this geometry is trying to remind us of is the uh, nature the principle of creation as a single whole as a finite reality with a diversity of elements but a center which is unique and that this creation is not haphazard or chaotic but is in perfect harmony and balance that so harmony balance proportion rhythm these are the things which these designs make us aware of whether we are conscious of it or not so like music pure classical music it's just pure sound 
but it is drawing it and particularly our classical music where each note is then ex revealed for in its different colors and variations the ways that you can approach it and then the relationship to another note then that is explored so it's these universal uh, realities which the art is communicating the realities being non-physical but the medium is physical in all of our projects we try to uh, be guided by these principles which are rooted in our own tradition now there are two aspects to this one is the practical the physical advantage of indigenous materials uh, they are going to be low cost they a soft footprint on the planet climatically more suitable um, and the forms uh, are, are more appropriate for the cultural practices but these are functional practical things um, the other aspect as I said is the the language and the message so the message really is the more important but there are practical advantages so for these reasons we try to be guided by these principles and nowadays I find I'm constantly um, these representatives of products and the first thing I say is it imported well that's one cross mark is it produced by some multinational corporation oh yes sir, our principal cross is it made by hand no sir by the most high-tech engine and <laughs> industry cross what we try to do is not to use any imported products not to use anything produced by multinational corporations not to use industrial processes either in the products or the assembly of a building and it takes uh, not rocket science to understand why this is what we need today the state of our economy and our ecology it is madness to just continuing you know they say when you find yourself stuck in a hole the first thing you do is stop digging and we just keep on digging more I use brick in the Lahore region because this is the cheapest permanent building material in the riverine plains and I use lime in place of cement because it is cheaper, longer lasting, ultimately stronger, better looking and cool. I prefer labor intensive techniques and avoid industrially produced materials, especially imported materials. I have found that the purpose of art traditionally has been to act as support in man's spiritual quest or journey by reminding him of his role and function in this life, by pointing to his true goal and by illuminating the way to that goal.